Gold traders took profits this week as the bullion saw the largest single day drop in years on Tuesday. But how are hedge funds and institutional investors positioned for the long term? Joining me today is Sean Filer, CIO of Equinox Partners, a value-oriented gold equities fund focused primarily on the junior mining space. Sean, welcome to Kiko News. It's a pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to just start with talking about price activity this week. You've maintained a bullish stance over the long term, but we saw tremendous selling activity, the most in years, on Tuesday. What can you make of this uh, sell-off that we saw? I think it's characteristic of a bull market. You tend to get uh, gradual increases and uh, punctuated by rapid sell-offs. Um, I also think there were some margin changes on the comics on uh, on money that aggravated some of that decline. Okay. The last major sell-off we saw in gold was in March. And uh, at that time, all assets saw a sell-off. Investors were rushing to safety and raising cash. Was that the case this week, you think? No. I mean, look, gold's up almost 30% on the year. The GDXJ is up 35% on the year. So uh, we are you know, well into a bull market in, in gold and gold and silver miners. Okay. Was there anything uh, fundamental in the markets, uh, macro-wise, that may have triggered this besides uh, just a technical correction? No. I think okay. it's just it's the way bull markets work. Sometimes the stocks go down. So long-term, you, uh, you are bullish on the metal. Uh, tell us about your macro thesis for, for gold. So what we're seeing both in fiscal policy-wise and monetary policy-wise, so much of it's unprecedented. And I don't think we're in for uh, you know just a short-term pop in gold and silver and a trading opportunity. I think we're we're in for a long-term bull market. And the valuation, the ratio of gold and silver, and in particular gold and silver miners in relationship to other financial assets, uh, is just coming off the the lows. And so I think we have whether it's three years, five years, ten years. I think we are really in for a a nice long bull market, both in gold and silver and in particular in the gold and silver mining companies. Mm -hmm. uh, let's touch on two of the uh, primary drivers of gold uh, over the long term, the dollar and inflation. Where do you see inflation headed over the next 12 months? Hard to say. I think over the next couple of years, higher. I mean, the Fed's been pretty explicit about wanting uh, higher inflation rates. And a year out from today, we're going to talk about be talking about Powell's replacement. And regardless of who win the, wins the election this November, I think we're likely to see more pressure to politicize the Fed and lose your monetary policy in the United States, all of which is going to be good for gold and silver. Do you see any risk for uh, deflationary pressures, Sean? No, very, no. I think, you know, we have monetary authorities so intent on preventing any kind of deflation. I think they're, they're more likely to err on the other side than they are to allow any deflation. And there's just not really a a viable sound money contingent politically in, in D.C. Uh, the yeah. fight over Shelton's confirmation is really a, a sign of the division there still exists even within the Republican Party on that issue. Mm -hmm. Shelton has written an op-ed uh, a few years ago um, <laughs> saying that she, 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 she's a proponent of the gold standard. Do you see any chance of us returning to a gold standard, Sean, in our lifetimes? Uh, it it doesn't seem like the most likely path forward, but I think we're going to see a, a lot of disruption in the existing monetary system over the next five to 10 years. So I think um, a lot of things that currently seem difficult to impossible may become more probable in a, in a more volatile situation. Okay. And what about the U.S. dollar? We have seen the DXY, the dollar index, trending downwards over the last three to four months. Uh, can this downward trajectory continue? And so we, we're back in an environment where every country wants a slightly weaker currency, if not a meaningfully weaker currency. Um, it's hard for all of the fiat money to depreciate against each other. It's just impossible. So I think that's why we can be confident in a bull market in gold and silver. The relationship of the dollar to the euro or the yen, um, I think, is as political as it is economic. And so it's really hard to put a fine point on that over time. Sean, is it really in the best interest of the U.S. Federal Reserve to maintain a negative real interest rate environment? No. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, I think uh, the U.S. should pursue responsible monetary policy and the Fed should re pursue responsible monetary policy. And that means not ending the business cycle and not trying to end the business cycle, but trying to preserve the purchasing power of the currency over time. 
that's just not where we are politically and that's not where the Fed is institutionally, right? The Fed is, is enamored of this idea that they can then smooth and take away the, the business cycle, right? Janet Yellen, shortly after leaving office, talked about the idea that we'd never see another financial crisis in her lifetime. And um, I think just the, the center of gravity of where the Fed is, is just at odds with financial reality. And I think that's going to be a difficult reckoning as it happens over the coming years. I actually saw Janet Yellen give a speech in uh, Montreal in 2018 at a conference. And uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said that economic expansions don't die of old age. They die, they're killed off by one of two things, financial imbalances or the Fed, implying that bad monetary policy is one of the reasons why recessions happen. And uh, in her defense, nobody at the Federal Reserve this year saw the coronavirus hitting the world. Actually, nobody did really. Uh, but um, my question now is, do you think that Powell would have taken a substantially different direction this year had COVID-19 not happened, uh, given the financial and economic conditions pre-COVID? Well, I mean, I think the whole idea that everything was fine prior to the COVID-19 crisis is just wrong. So we had $400 billion added to the Fed's balance sheet because the repo market blew up starting last fall. And that's all pre-COVID-19. So we had a system that was over-levered, very fragile, despite having extraordinary low rates and a bloated Fed balance sheet prior to this crisis. You know, this crisis has taken our fiscal deficits to unprecedented levels, merged monetary and fiscal policy in a way that the academy has long argued should never happen, and given the Fed a free reign, uh, a license to go back to um, very aggressive policies it was pursuing over much of the last decade. So um, it's not normal, and it doesn't look to be going back to normal anytime soon. Okay, so just going back to questions here you, uh, about negative real interest rates, you said that uh, we're not politically ready to get out of the situation. Are you implying that there is some sort of political incentive to maintain low rates right now? No, so I mean, I, if, you, if you look at... Um, the debate in Congress about sound money. If you look at, if you watch Judy Shelton's confirmation hearings, you see uh, radical opposition to sound money from Democrats across the board in a very organized fashion. And you see division uh, amongst the Republicans when it comes to sound money. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that you can't have one voice on the Federal Reserve that's in favor of um, orthodox monetary policy is shocking, but that's where we are. And you've now seen um, Senators Romney and Collins come out um, publicly against uh, Judy Shelton's confirmation um, as an effort, I presume, in an effort to try to derail um, a full vote in the Senate for her, for her confirmation. <laughs>